is Timothy Avila, and I'm a PhD student at uh, University of Leipzig. And today I'm going to talk about the mobile client for distributed uh, semantic social network. So first, let's look at the agenda. Um, excuse me for a second. I guess we'll have to do it like this. Okay, so first I'm going to talk a bit about the current state of uh, social networking as we have it now. Uh, then I'm going to talk about the motivation on why we decided to create a distributed uh, semantic social network. Uh, then I'm going to explain the architecture of the uh, distributed semantic social network itself and talk about the client we did the model client, uh, how we evaluated it, and conclude my talk with some thoughts on the topic. So let's start with the current state. Uh, first, I want to show this uh, picture from actually XKCD comic strip. If you are not familiar with it, you should take a look. So this picture is actually quite old. I think this is from something like 2010 or something. But it still shows how many uh, social networks uh, is out there uh, at the moment. And uh, going to the next picture, I just want to remember what uh, Zorn uh, said in his talk before, that uh, the uh, that at the moment is a uh, wall garden. So all of these social networks exist in a separate, uh, basically, infrastructures and it's really hard to integrate them into something uh, single or, I don't know, to extract your data or to do whatever you want with it if you have separate accounts. So that's like a big problem. And here we come to motivation, basically. So these are the points that uh, are quite problematic from our point of view. So the first one is, of course, the privacy. I mean, if your data is somewhere out there on a servers, like on a Facebook or LinkedIn servers, how do you know that, uh, that your privacy is, uh, like your data is safe, basically, yeah? No one looks at it, like the employees of Facebook are not taking a peek at your secret society posts or something like that. Uh, the second and the third uh, points are data security and data ownership, so basically it's the same thing, your data is on a Facebook or LinkedIn servers and there's no way, like, I mean, there's no way to find out if it's secure unless they tell you, like, okay, we was breached, now we're hacked your data is leaked. But they might just decide not to tell it to you because it was really small breach and few accounts leaked, so no one cares. And the same goes for data ownership, so the data is on their servers, so how can you own it if it's on their hardware and they control it? Uh, the next point is extensibility. So all of the social networks existing today are proprietary technology and all of them are controlled by corporations. So you can build something on top of the API that they provide, but you can't really extend the network itself uh, from the core. Then there is reliability. Again, talking about the security breaches, uh, you cannot really rely on the uh, consistency or, or on the civil, like for example, security, yes, yeah, so or that they, uh, they try to guarantee the availability of your profile all the time, but still uh, there are breaches happening from time to time, and yeah, a lot of problems can happen. And the last point of view is the uh, freedom of communications. And uh, uh, yeah, I'll just show you the figures. So, first figure, I just want to show you this uh, PlayStation Network event. I think it was already mentioned today. 
So basically, in, uh, it started in April of 2011. The PlayStation Network was breached, and uh, the accounts of 77 million users was leaked, including the credit cards data and personal data and the home addresses and whatever you can imagine. It's like really huge breach. But the main problem was even not that it was breached, not that all the data was stolen, they acted quite quickly and notified all the subscribers. The problem was that after the breach, the PlayStation Network was down for something like four months or so. They couldn't fix the uh, security issue. And users just couldn't use the network for four whole months just because of someone broke in. That's quite sad. And uh, talking about, let me make it a bit smaller. Yeah. Talking about the freedom of uh, communication, I mean, there is countries like China, partially Russia. So here on the right side, you can see the map, which, is, uh, which was made by the uh, uh, reporters without borders. And uh, it depicts basically the amount of censorship in the internet all over the world. So the black countries are the ones that have the most censorship. And like you can see, like for example, China, they basically now have their own internet there with their own social networks that are controlled by the government. And uh, like Russia is red because there's also quite a lot of censorship going on on the internet. And basically when the corporation controls the social network, they can do whatever they want with your uh, ability to communicate with others. So that's, that's a problem. And yeah, now let's talk about the architecture of a distributed semantic social network. So first about the three simple principles. Uh, the first one is the linked data. Basically, it allows uh, to publish and integrate uh, the resources basically without adding anything else. So linked data can be easily accessed from anywhere. Uh, the second one is the uh, service decoupling. So this will basically allow to separate the user data which he owns from all the services and publishers and as well allow uh, different publishers to exist on the market simultaneously because then they can, you can just, user can just pick whoever he wants. And the last one is the protocol minimalism. So basically there is no need to invent uh, new protocols or new data models or whatever. All this stuff is already out there. There is RDF, there's uh, linked data, there is, uh, I don't know, sparking for requests, sparking query, uh, Spark update queries for updating the data, and we don't really need to invent anything new. We can just use it. So now let's uh, take, uh, well, let's talk about what means uh, distributed. So here you can see the picture that shows, uh, like on the first one, you can see the centralized network. So you have a central server, everyone is connected to it. And again, that's the problem with the central server is down, no one can use the network. So the second picture shows a decentralized network. But again, there's like a set of servers that communicate between each other, but if one of them is down, then users that rely on the server cannot use anything. But the last picture shows the distributed network. So this basically means that every node has a connection to every other node, or any other node. And if one of them is down, then others can communicate freely, and it doesn't really matter if one of the nodes is out of the network. Uh, now let's take a look at the technological overview of the uh, architecture. So there is uh, four layers here in the architecture of the distributed semantic social network. Uh, first layer is the data layer. Uh, second layer is the actually protocol layer, which is represented by all these arrows here. Third layer is the service layer, and the last one is the application layer. So we'll go a bit more details. So the first one is the data layer. Uh, data layer basically represents all the data that actually is owned by users. So it's, of course, web IDs of the people. It's uh, everything they post online, like videos, pictures, links to websites, and any other resource that can be posted is related to the data layer. Uh, second layer is the protocol layer, and this is basically what transmits the data. Yeah? So it's uh, linked data. We have here Spark Query. Uh, we have semantic pingback, and we have PubSub Hubbub. So if you are not familiar, PubSub Hubbub is a protocol developed by Google for uh, subscribing uh, for notifications about the new updates of the feed. 
And semantic pingback is something that was developed uh, in our research group, partially uh, specifically for this uh, distributed social semantic network case. So it's, uh, the idea is quite simple, actually. Um, how many of people here are familiar with the pingback protocol? Not okay. Uh, yeah, well, uh, yeah, so semantic pingback is based on a regular pingback protocol, which is widely used in a blog. Uh, blocking area and uh, basically allows notification about the usage of a resource in some other place. So in the normal case, we need another block, and in semantic case, we be reference to another semantic resource. And in case of the social network, it's used uh, for two things. So first one is friending. Basically, when someone adds your profile to his both nose network, uh, he gets you get a notification that this person added you to his both network and if you do the same and his client as well gets this notification then you are considered to be friends. And the same goes for uh, marking up resources with uh, like tags or comments or whatever. All of this utilizes this meta pingback. So now a bit more on uh, how it actually works. So it has two parties. The first one is the publisher of the resource and the second one is uh, basically the link receiver, uh, as we can call them. So, publisher of resource has some resource that is published on the net, uh, link data enabled and with a pingback server. Then, link receiver wants to, or creates a post or a comment when he references the resource that is published by the first party. If both of them have semantic pingback servers, then the link receiver sends a special semantic pingback to the publisher and says, hey look, uh, my owner wrote a post about you. Then the publisher goes to this post and checks if uh, it was really the, this resource, the published resource reference. So this is just done for security measures, basically to check and verify that it's really uh, this resource, not some kind of spam or something. And if it's really so, then the publisher adds a special link that this resource is referenced from this page and you can read more about it there, for example. So, uh, you can imagine like photos or, I mean, there's quite a lot of use cases. Uh, yeah, so the third layer is uh, service layer and uh, all the basically traditional web uh, services like push, uh, get, um, I don't know, updates and whatever you can imagine is here. Yeah, so they just serve as a methods to get and push and fetch the data. And the last layer is the application layer. So this is a layer where all the applications, be it a blog or a photo uploader or a mobile devices and clients, needs. So anything that is made upon this architecture is considered to be the application layer. And it works completely discreetly from the everything else. So it is not required for functioning of the whole thing. And this takes us to our mobile DSS and client. So it actually consists of two parts uh, for various reasons. So we, we needed a ubiquitous client that would work on as many devices as possible. Uh, thus we decided to do it with HTML5 and JavaScript since web applications can run on pretty much any modern ubiquitous device. But then we needed some uh, way to integrate this uh, client into the mobile device more tightly. So say, uh, synchronize the web ID contacts uh, with a contact book of your phone. This unfortunately yet cannot be done with the web app. So we decided to use a uh, hybrid applications, uh, hybrid mobile applications technology and uh, as an example in paper that's presented the phone get application uh, which uses the native extension to synchronize your contacts from web ID to uh, your uh, contact book on your Android phone. So the uh, multi-platform application was written with JavaScript stack, we already mentioned before, and uh, followed the uh, standard MDC uh, architecture. It utilized based basically on uh, most popular open source libraries, um, such as jQuery for uh, event handling and document manipulation. Uh, backbone JS for handling the models and data synchronization and everything basically that is related to the data. 
uh, RDF query for working with the RDF and Sparkling on the client side, uh, jQuery mobile for uh, visualizing the whole thing, uh, making UI, and you know, basically for whatever you use the jQuery mobile. Uh, what else? And yeah, that's basically it. Oh yeah, okay, right. The J feed for working with the activity feeds which are present in the Atom or uh, RSS format. So uh, here you can see in uh, screenshots uh, example of the prog, like there's basically two interfaces, the browsing and editing. So this is the screenshots of a browsing interface. So on the first screenshot you can see the basic introduction uh, view of a mobile client which asks you to enter your web ID and URI. That later uh, on the screen, uh, screenshot two you can see the render web ID. This is a test web ID which had only a few predicates so it doesn't really looks fancy unfortunately, but well, uh, on the third screenshot you can see the visualization of a whole network of a person, so all of these profiles are of course clickable, you can tap on it and see the profile the same way you can see it on a, a, a screenshot number two. And the last screenshot, number four, uh, shows the activity feed the same way you will see it in Facebook, but all of these are uh, RDF resources and actually can be query, for example, if you want to make a more complex activity fit with some filters or special conditions, for example. And this is an example of uh, screenshots of an uh, editing interface. So on the screenshot one, you can see the interface uh, which was made to edit your own uh, full profile. So unfortunately, it only did work if uh, the full provider supported Spark and update queries, which is not too common now. But as you can see, it's quite simple. So you have a set of predicates as labels for input boxes, and then you have your values in input boxes, which are mostly literals and strings. Uh, then on the screenshot two, you can see how you can uh, delete your friends from network if you so desire. Uh, on screenshot three, you can see how you can search uh, for actually both profiles. For search, we use the Synergy. Uh, search engine with a special query which searches only for web IDs and full profiles in there. And uh, yeah, on the last screenshot you can see the creation of activity right right from the client, and you can as well attach a photo or video from your camera. So this is something that uh, mobile web apps are allowed to do now, and it's quite easy to implement. And yeah, now about the evaluation. So. Uh, to evaluate the uh, whole thing, we used the semantic web basic test, which was developed one of, by one of the subgroups of W3C. And uh, in uh, this code snippet, you can see uh, basically the steps that any application should complete to be considered uh, a complete uh, social network. So uh, to verify that our mobile client really fits into our architecture, we tested this uh, uh, SWOT. Uh, we made this SWOT analysis basically with two backends. So we used onto wiki based uh, backend as the first uh, benchmark and Diver based uh, backend as the second benchmark. Uh, so onto wiki was picked because uh, the first implementation of the uh, distributed semantic social network was done on it and basically we have everything set up already so we just need to attach the mobile client and try if it works. And Dytra is a cloud-hosted RDF provider uh, with a Spark endpoint and basically quite a lot of fancy features there. So we decided to try it out and see how it will work with it. Uh, so SWOT zero test was passed by client on both backends without any problems. Uh, that, that's basically why we published the paper. And now to conclude my talk. So. We presented a mobile client for distributed semantic social network. Uh, rather than a client, it's actually a framework which can be easily extended to uh, represent uh, to do quite pretty much anything in, uh, in relation to the social networking with the semantic technology in the base. And uh, since mobile phones and, and like ubiquitous devices, tablets are. Uh, gaining more and more popularity and power in this time, I think it's quite important uh, step in a social, semantic social networking. 
but there are a few uh, future work steps that we want to do. So the first one would be to uh, make an easier, to give an easier way uh, to create uh, web ID for a user because now it's quite problematic. You have to create your both profile uh, by your own. Sometimes maybe even in, in a notepad or something like this, and then publish it somewhere. So it would be nice to have a way to do it right in the application after you installed it. And the second is to extend the mobile client even more and add more features, add like additional, basically separate applications like calendars, events, and all the things that normal social networks have now, but with a semantically backed technology. And that's it. Thank you. You, uh, in your motivation, you spoke a lot about privacy and about people from Facebook spying on my communication. How do you actually prevent that now? Uh, yeah, I didn't talk actually about that in the talk, but probably it's my bad. But uh, there is a 4 plus SSL authentication protocol, uh, which basically allows you to specify uh, who of your friends can access what data. So they authenticate with their own web ID, and then you can say, hey, this is a group of friends that can access just I don't know, my work details, and this is a group of my childhood friends who can see everything that it does. And also implemented on a semantic web stack with existing tools, and there's no need to invent it.